I was a preacher's kid, exactly. And I was the, it, preacher's kids come in two flavors. I was one and my brother was the other. My brother was the really good one, he did everything you were supposed to do and achieved everything you're supposed to achieve and I was that other one. I don't know how you describe it. Mississippi ministers in that era, they tended to move them around. So we, I started in Forest Hills, Mississippi, right outside of Jackson, was in Hattiesburg, Forest, and Brookhaven, where I graduated from high school and then went to college my freshman year at Millsaps in Jackson. So I had a bit of a run. Yeah, I think like every teenager, I probably was interested in music. And I got interested in, in album rock was really coming up at that period, this sort of underground sound, uh, psychedelic music, and uh, sort of diverging from pop music. And I was fascinated with it. Um, you know, that was late 60s, early 70s. And uh, that began to be a uh, you know, real interest to me. I was on a radio station in Mississippi then called the 102.9 Stereo Rock in Jackson, Mississippi. And it was this big, huge signal that went all the way from New Orleans to Memphis. And um, I, I started radio in a little small town, Brookhaven. And, but I dreamed of working on the 102.9 Stereo Rock. And that was one of the stations that was. Uh, and before that, we heard a nice, tasty track from Dr. John. Uh, and you imagine somebody in a dark room with tie-dye parachutes hanging all over the ceilings. Um, and, uh, and that's what every cool kid wanted to be. And I finally got a job there working Sunday mornings. Uh, couldn't work during the week, but I could work Sunday mornings in case they let me fill in some other time. But I was suddenly a part of that cool radio station. The thesis was that you had a generation that had grown up with music, rock music, and had grown up with TV, and the two had never successfully come together. And, and my theory was the reason they hadn't come together is TV people kept trying to make music fit the TV form, which was really story, narrative, story art. And so with MTV, we decided we would make TV fit the music form, which is mood, emotion, attitude. And MTV was all attitude. It was like, come join us. We're rebellious. We reject everything. We're doing TV a new way. And, uh, and that became sort of our calling card. And uh, obviously, it, it worked. And MTV was not only sort of combined TV and music, rock music, but it also changed sort of sensibilities about design, fashion, uh, even movies. We did, it's sort of hard to imagine, but uh, you're in TV. People, in, when they edited, used to do the, lay the video down and roll the music under it. And with MTV, we laid the music track first and then cut the video on the beat of the music. And no one had done that. That was like a great innovation. Uh, but it was suddenly, you realized how much it propelled you through the video and through all the messages we did. And, that went into commercial production and you know, images for other businesses. And so we unleashed a lot that we had not anticipated. We really didn't get the content for free. We played the videos for free. But remember, we had the VJs all through it. We had all that on-air production. We had those big contests, the specials we did, the Lost Weekend with Van Halen, the One Night Stand with, uh, uh, with Fleetwood Mac, uh, uh, Paint the House Pink with John Mellencamp. Um, and we would go out, cover stuff on location. We did music news segments, we covered the news. So it was an enormous amount of, of programming in addition to the music videos. And I think before MTV, people had tried to do stuff with music videos. Indeed, I had done a show on NBC called Album Tracks, which ran after Saturday Night Live, that was, you know, we'd play a little bit of a music video and then we'd do some music news, but no one could quite figure out how to make it work. And we figured out that the music videos were not the programming. Music videos were a program fragment that we could put and create the programming with them in it. And I think it's that difference that really made MTV so special. MTV was a, one of the first TV networks where people didn't say, oh, I'm going to tune in to see such and such show. I wonder what network that's on. They would say, I wonder what's on MTV. I'm going to tune in. They would tune in MTV to see what was going on. We were hanging out with the audience. And you could join us at any time, and there was a certain excitement. You knew you would find out what's happening with music and sort of the community you lived in. And for us, we were also the first network that showed what L.A. and New York and London really looked like. On the TV networks, they tried to make everything look like it was Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, so everybody looked like they lived in Omaha. They dressed like they lived in Omaha. They had the Midwest accent. 
And for MTV, we showed them what was going on at CBGB's. Uh, we showed them what was going on in the whiskey. Uh, we showed them what was going on in London. Um, and that was, I think, the, the eye-opener for America. Uh, was like, what? People dress like that? What? They're doing that? And, and, you know, it sort of seems weird at a time like this, but back then, you didn't know what went on in another city. You really had no way of finding out unless there happened to be a big news story and the national news networks covered some story about a particular city. But, uh, and today, obviously, we know because of the Internet, we're connected to everywhere, but we weren't then. And MTV was sort of the first window into this, what was going on in these places that you might not have known. We did the first rock and roll uh, New Year's Eve at the Diplomat Hotel in New York. Now, anyone outside of New York at that moment would have been scared to death to go to the Diplomat. I mean, this ratty, nasty hotel. Had to walk up these stairs, and then you go to this ballroom, and we had all these acts there. Well, we had never done an event before as our first one. We had no idea how to do an event, and we over-invited. So the first night, there were people, I hit there, there were line around the block. People had a ticket, they didn't have room for them to get in. Fire marshal was threatening to shut us down at any minute. We had one of the acts was Bow Wow Wow. I would, walked outside just sort of go, oh my gosh, what's going on? I see Bow Wow standing in line. They couldn't even get in. So I had to hustle them in. But MTV was that. It was always just a little renegade, a, a little ragged, and we're always pushing the envelope. We invented everything as we went because we broke every rule. Uh, when we did the on-air look for MTV, which at that time was a real breakthrough look, uh, we broke every rule. Basically, people were doing these big chrome logos coming out of, like Star Wars, out of a star field. And uh, the, the head of On Air, uh, Fred Seibert, and I were sort of brainstorming about what are we going to do for our On Air look? And I kept thinking we're going to do our version of what everybody else is doing, because that's all my limited brain could think of. And Fred said, here's the problem, Bob. We don't have enough money. So if we do that look, ours will look very cheap. But if we do something radically different looking, they won't know it's cheap. It just looks different. So that's what led us to doing that, you know, all the NASA footage, the man on the moon, because it was cheap. Um, and to do the black and white footage, don't watch that, watch this. And, you know, contrast of TV to MTV. And, uh, and we had a logo. Logos were supposed to always stay the same color, the same look, and stay in the same location. Our logo danced, it changed colors, it flashed around, it moved around, we had claymation on it. And it was just a different way of doing graphic design and doing looks. And obviously, you know, we, 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 we changed the world of design in that process. Obviously, we didn't have any intent to do that. We weren't trying to be a disruptor. We were just trying to have a successful network. I have a CFDA award, which is the Academy Awards of Fashion, which I got because of the impact MTV had on fashion. We had a lot of our producers, directors, even working in MTV, went on to great careers in the, the motion picture and TV business. Uh, we had people who went on to do graphic design, advertising, um, and we just sort of spread out from there. But it was this original sort of hotbed of creativity in the early 80s that spawned so many other ideas and so many other uh, incredible endeavors. MTV probably started out to be sort of this album, cool album rock station. But as time went on, we began to push the boundaries. And probably MTV gets credit for introducing rap to America, uh, of all things. And so it began to push genres as we began to get a little more arrogant and a little more adventurous and a little more like, oh, we can make anything. Let's try this, let's try. We brought back the monkeys. We put Tony Bennett on. It was, we brought wrestling into the mainstream by putting Cindy Lauper and wrestlers and so it, at a certain point, it began to see how far can we push the boundaries as opposed to how much can the boundaries constrain us. And I think when that happened, that was a, a freeing moment for, for MTV and the creativity of the, of the folks there because no one wanted to be limited, especially at our age. We wanted to blow it out. We were, all of us except Tom Freston and the original founders were, were under 30. And we sort of had a half serious uh, idea that no one over the age of 30 has any good ideas, so we need to make sure we're hiring lots of people in their 20s and helping them bring their ideas to life. We were so young that we didn't value experience. So if you had come from CBS or NBC, we probably didn't want you because we'd say, you know what, you're going to try and do what they're doing. Uh, we wanted people who had been sort of on the edge, who were working like, 
Manhattan cable and had a nickel to spend or someone who had been in an editing room and just worked in and always had some ideas and they were begging someone to do it. And, uh, and those were the people we were looking for. We were looking for people who really worked hard, really smart, really articulate, could fight their positions through because we had a lot of just a serious fights and debates about this, this, or this, and, uh, and, and had a real passion and a passion for music. I do a, a podcast called Math and Magic, stories from the frontiers of marketing. And, and I've had all the original people that worked with me on the creation of MTV on, and, and it's interesting, Judy McGrath, who went on to be the CEO of MTV Networks, and Fred Seibert, who did the on-air look, both of them tell the story of their interview and with Judy, and, and Fred was this very self-righteous musically guy, and he would say, and he said in the interview, Judy said the same thing, he said, what music do you like? And she said, Bruce Springsteen. He said, wrong. Uh, and she said, well, I'm, I'm not gonna get the job. He calls her anyway. And, but I mean, that was the way it was. People said, no, wrong, that's the wrong answer. No, not Bruce Springsteen. Go, wait a minute, I thought you asked me who I liked. Uh, but that was the kind of attitude that went on there. It's a very super sure of themselves, wildly creative people who are willing to bust through and had the confidence to do an idea no one approved of and no one had ever done before. Michael Jackson and Madonna were really the first two artists that were really what I would call the video music artist. They weren't a singer or performer who then says, oh, and I got to do a video. They were the ones that just thought of it all in one. And Michael Jackson became very important to us because we had, and people sort of forget this era, but there was Susan Baker and Tipper Gore had these, uh, invest, uh, these hearings in Washington. Uh, you may remember Frank Zappa was one of the witnesses in which they were trying to say rock and roll music and music videos are very bad for our kids today and we need to limit or label or whatever. So we started a, a, a standards sensor um, uh, group, because we had to, of saying, okay, we got to approve every video. And there was a video by a guy named Rick James uh, that was not approved uh, by the way today standards, of course, it's nothing. But back then, it was, oh my gosh, that's so risque, we can't put it on TV. And Rick James made this claim that MTV didn't play any black artist, which was not true, but, uh, but it sort of stuck. And all of us are going, well, that's the last thing we want people to think about us. So we actually proactively want to say, okay, who can we get that's really going to be a black artist that's going to be really big? And about that time, Quincy Jones was finishing the Michael Jackson album. So we began talking to Quincy, I began talking to CBS Records and saying, okay, we want to make this thing huge. And so when he gave us Billie Jean, it went into the stratosphere. And by the way, no one had ever seen anyone dancing and moving like that. Again, this true first, think of it as the first real MTV artist. And so he was, and he was getting the extra push from us. And then we did Beat It, also huge. And then Michael and his management came and said, I want to do a third video, but CBS Records won't pay for it because they'll only pay for two videos per album. We go, gosh, we can't get in the business of paying for all the videos. We'll go broke. That'd be a terrible precedent. But boy, is he big and boy, is he important. So we came up with this idea that we would do a documentary called The Making of Thriller. But embedded in the budget of The Making of Thriller was actually Thriller. Um, and so it was a clever, and we had Showtime to come in on part of it, and a video company called Vestron to invest with us, and we all put it together, pooled our money, and we, in essence, paid for Thriller, but we also did the making of Thriller, which is probably still around somewhere. And, uh, and Thriller turned out to be one of the biggest videos we'd ever had. And this was before the days of on-demand videos, so if you wanted to see something, you had to figure out when it was gonna be played, and so we would schedule it every hour. And people all around America were like setting their clocks to tune in to see that thriller video. Um, and, uh, and sort of blew it out. And, and uh, Michael went on to win one of the Video Vanguard Awards. And Quincy Jones was, uh, was as you, you, you know, one of the you know, amazing producer. And we developed sort of a, a, a lifelong relationship and, a, and certainly a career long for me relationship with Quincy uh, out of that. And I think we also really learned a lot about an MTV artist. Choreography, looks, style, and music all fit together to make this special artist.
The dirty little secret of MTV is there were not enough videos to start MTV when we started. We had about 250 videos. And by the way, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel to find those. And in, you're correct, in England and in, the, and in Europe, um, artists didn't break off records on the radio. They didn't play that much music on the radio. They broke off of TV shows, Top of the Pops, Old Grey Whistle Test, Germany was Rock Palace. There were a number of them, so they would make these videos and then send them around to all the TV shows. And that's what their videos were for. So there was, you know, 10 to 1 uh, European and, and UK videos to American videos. So when we launched, we had this preponderance of, of English videos. And so people say, it's the second the British invasion, the Brits are back. Well, the Brits are back because the Americans aren't making any videos. Bruce Springsteen weren't making any videos. Most of the American artists weren't making any videos. And so for a little while, there was that moment. And, and you know, an American singers, and actually a lot of the British singers that did well in America always sang with a, with a southern accent, an American accent. Uh, these artists weren't singing with an American accent. They were, they were British, like madness. Our house, da, 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 da. You know, so it's like this sort of poppy, European kind of, 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 uh, of music and or the ska with the specials and people like that. And, uh, and it really opened up uh, the lane a lot of these, this British sound and it's very distinctive 80s and it's an accidental uh, outcome, an accident of not having enough American videos. Live Aid was interesting. We'd done a, a, a there had been a record that Bob Geldof had organized uh, to fight hunger in Africa, it was called Band Aid, uh, and it was a Christmas time record. And, Bob, and Chip Racklin, who was our head of talent acquisitions, called me and said, "Listen, Bob Geldof wants to do this concert, uh, sort of like Band Aid, but he's going to do it for the bigger concert in, in the UK, and uh, and he wants us to buy the rights to it to help uh, finance it and to get the word out." So I so he, I met with Bob. And we sort of started brainstorming. He said, you know, what might be bigger is what if we produce this thing as a fundraiser and we do it live and we get not just us to carry it, but we'll let any other network that wants to carry it as well. We'll carry it on the radio and we'll ask for donations on the air. Mind you, this is for the days of texting and Venmo and everything else. Uh, and I think we, and so that's what we did. And we decided to add uh, Philadelphia and Wembley, so we, you know, UK and America, uh, we did it live, and uh, and this was in the days of the Concord, and actually Phil Collins was played at both. He was the uh, Wembley ran and got on the Concord and made it to play play at RFK Stadium in Philadelphia, and uh, as drummer for for uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, and uh, and it was just sort of this uh, amazing event. Well, by the way, I was producing on stage. I'm not a producer, uh, but we were all like hands-on and in the middle of it, and uh, and we raised I think 60, 80 million dollars, which in those days was extraordinary, especially as all people calling in and phone pledging. ABC carried it for about I think three or four hours in prime time. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else carried it on TV internationally. We got some some carriage, um, and it really sort of changed the idea of how we can use music for causes. We did Farm Aid after that and did some other uh, uh, events as well, but uh, I, I think Live Aid has never been topped in terms of being that sort of revolutionary. At MTV, we always wanted to be relevant to the audience. So we're constantly saying, what's the audience doing right now? What's important to them? How, do we, how are we a part of it? Well, spring break is such a part of the youth culture and no one had ever done something with spring break. So let's say, let's go do spring break and let's just do the craziness of spring break because it's very much the attitude of MTV. And, uh, and that led us to spring break, spring break out, you know, all the permutations we had of spring break. And, uh, and again, was a moment for MTV to be relevant to the audience and be bonded to the audience and be doing something that no one on TV would have ever done, way too dangerous. Uh, in those days to do something like that. But again, it was us pushing the envelope. I got an opportunity in Mississippi to understand the pulse of real America. I think one of the problems, I live in New York um, and uh, spent a lot of time in California too, 
And there's a certain truth to the people in New York and LA I think the world is that. Um, and it's always been a gift of mine to be able to understand that that's not America, um, that this is America. And, uh, and having that in my background has served me well, not only through MTV, but through everything I do uh, that's, uh, that's consumer marketing or programming or content or storytelling or products. And, uh, and I, so I'm forever grateful uh, to have that kind of experience and have the kind of upbringing I did. Whether it's AOL when the internet first started coming along, uh, whether it was MTV uh, with cable networks and marrying music and television, or whether it's iHeart with iHeart Radio with you know, 250 other ways to listen to radio stations besides an AM, FM radio, or podcasting, which we're the number one podcaster in the world now. Um, but I never look at it as technology. I look at it as the consumer. And I always say, what's the consumer doing? And how should my product or what should I be doing with that consumer? That, okay, once you've got this, what, what can you do? And, and at iHeart, for example, uh, the strategy is be where our consumers are with the products and services they expect from us. So that's pretty broad. So if, if you've got a telephone and you like your favorite radio station, shouldn't your favorite radio station be on your phone? Or you got a video game console, shouldn't your favorite radio station be available there? Or by the way, a smart TV. So you see iHeartRadio in all those places. And I think with podcasting, we begin to understand that this experience of listening to hosts talking to you about something, that we can go with a podcast a lot deeper. When we're on the air with a radio show, it's pretty broad, but you can't go too deep because you're covering so many people. But in podcasts, we can take one topic and go deep. And with that topic that you're going deep with, that's the podcast. But it's very host driven. Somebody's keeping me company. I'm listening to somebody I enjoy listening to talk and tell me stuff, good storyteller. And, uh, and, and so for us, it's a matter of just continuing to listen to the consumer and build it. I mean, at AOL, when I came into it, a lot of people thought the internet was very sophisticated technology. Uh, my approach, and I was the chief operating officer at AOL, um, and, and sort of trying to figure out how do we make this thing mass market, is I said, I think actually most consumers are just looking for, they're not interested in the technology, they're interested in what it can do for them, and they want it to be really easy. So in my day there, the, the line of AOL, so easy to use, no wonder we're number one. Um, and uh, you know, we have one commercial with one of the kids says, so easy to use, even my dad can do it. Uh, and that was really the, the, the cry there. So I, I, I think as, as I look, I've, I've actually been in situations which today they would call a disruptor, but I never thought I was a disruptor. I just thought I was listening to people and giving them what they wanted. The essence of radio is we're not TV without pictures. We do something different. We keep people company. We're companionship. We're hanging out. And so anytime, day or night, as a matter of fact, the mission of our company is to give everybody in America a friend anytime, anywhere. Uh, so if, whoever you are, tune in. We'll keep you company. And by the way, when terrible disasters happen, we stop whatever the normal programming is, and we tell you where to go get your supplies, who you can help, what can be done. If there's a hurricane coming, we're talking to you about evacuation routes and what you need to do to get ready. Uh, time of COVID, we've you know, spent an enormous amount of time trying to keep the public informed, up to date, and keep rumors at a low, keep information high. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's what we do, and podcasting has been a wonderful extension of that experience. In a funny way, it's sort of radio on demand. Uh, yeah, there's a show, but instead of having to catch it at noon, appointment radio, you can just tune in anytime you want to and listen to it. If you want to tell a friend about it, then go listen to it at another time as well. What we're doing is we don't want a star, we want a friend. And it's interesting, Ryan Seacrest is one of our big, big talent. And Ryan will talk about that he's out with some TV or movie stars and the paparazzi see them or fans see them or somebody sees them and they come after them. So the fans, when they see them, will, will often look at him and say, ah, Ryan, could you take my picture of me with them? And he goes, they're treating Ryan like he's their friend and them like they're the star. And Ryan says, if that ever changes, I'm in trouble because that's what I need to be for them. I need to be a, their friend, not a star. After MTV sort of got going, I turned my attention to Nickelodeon, which had been really, when, we, when it was started, a preschoolers channel, and which wasn't a big audience uh, potential. And 
we decided to, a lady named Jerry Laybourne was in the programming department. We had ideas about what could we do in Nickelodeon and hit on this idea of being for the tweens, the older kids, and, uh, and really refocused Nickelodeon. And we, actually the guy who did the on-air look for MTV, Fred Seibert, then did the on-air look for Nickelodeon, the orange and all the shapes. And the idea with Nickelodeon was we wanted Nickelodeon to be cool and hip for these kids. And after we sort of got Nick going in the tween section, we, Nickelodeon went off the air at night because they said, well, it's not good to put kids programming on all night because they got to go to bed. And we had rented out our satellite transponder, because there were very few of them in those days, to arts and entertainment. And they were paying us like a million bucks or something. So we got to be able to do something that makes more money than that. So we hit upon this idea of doing very cheap programming, but very cool and edgy by doing Nick at Night. We'll take all these old programs, and but we'll just put them with an attitude to it, like we're trying to be campy and do Nick at Night. And uh, Nick at Night turned out to be a, a big hit as a result. I'm a wildly, sometimes perhaps dangerously curious person that I'm just always fascinated by what else and what, what's something I don't know anything about. And, and so I'm always in search of something that captures my interest. Uh, my, my family used to say I was sort of had a hobby a day as a kid that I would find something to be obsessive about and then move on to something else. And that's just sort of what interests me. And so I've moved my career a lot. I've done lots of things. And, uh, but I've had a very rich life as a result of doing it all. And as soon as I'm sort of successful, I'd rather go back and be unsuccessful again and try and build a success. And to me, that's the fun of it. And it's not just me, it's, it's building those teams and the camaraderie you have of the team when you're, you say, okay, let's go do something big. And when you get together with someone to do that, that camaraderie is just so special. And, uh, and the people I've done that with were lifelong friends because we were bonded over that, that experience of figuring something out and then executing it extraordinarily well. And by the way, often adjusting it because as you get going, it never quite works out as you plan. So you gotta keep moving it and shifting it to get it where it needs to go. In those days, the audience was much smaller on cable and the broadcast network said this huge audience. Today, they're all about equal. Uh, but in that moment in time, what we had is that we had this smaller audience because it was only this group of people. We super served them and that boy, did they love us and the impact for advertisers being a part of that was strong. It's like podcasting today. Podcast audience are smaller than a radio audience, but we get premium advertising rates because the audience that's listening to podcasting really loves that podcast. Uh, so the passion translates into better response for advertisers for, per, per probably dollar spent. It's interesting, on podcasting, I think that the people understand that the sponsors are sponsoring this and there's a certain loyalty to it. And, uh, and there's a certain affinity to the people who are willing to support this thing they like so much. And uh, we've got uh, How Stuff Works is one of our podcasts, the biggest podcast of all time, over a billion downloads. And boy, that's a maniacally loyal audience for that. And they have a group of people who've listened to every single episode of it. Um, and they take great pride in that. And, uh, and to be able to be a part of that as a sponsor uh, sort of has some benefits far beyond how many people you're reaching. The initial response to, from advertising and advertising agencies was, why do I want to touch that thing? Sorry, I don't know anything about it. You don't have a Nielsen rating, the no ratings, go away. Um, I was the head of programming. We were supposed to do an original business plan. I was making the product. Uh, we were supposed to do $10 million first year revenue. We did 500000 Within about a year, my boss was gone, who was the head, had responsibility for sales, and they basically said, hey, kid, you think you can figure out how to make money on this thing? And uh, that began my career moving to the business side. And, uh, and at first, it was hard because no advertiser wants to do something new. But certain when you go talk to the advertiser, not through the agency, talk to the advertiser, sometimes they could see the connection and move. And, a fellow named Roger Enrico was running Pepsi-Cola at the time, and we had no ratings. And Roger, though, saw that all the kids were watching this thing called MTV, so he didn't have to have a rating. And so he turned out to be our biggest advertiser. Uh, Coca-Cola didn't advertise. For the first five years, Coca-Cola didn't run one spot on MTV, just Pepsi-Cola. 
So Roger had basically an exclusive. And in that five-year period, as a result of having that exclusive on MTV, Pepsi moved their market share against Coke, the most it had ever been moved until that moment and the most it's ever moved after that moment. And finally, Coca-Cola figured out what was going on and started buying MTV. And then they outspent Pepsi two to one for the next 10 years to try and erase the memory of Pepsi being MTV and Coca-Cola being missing. So, you know, I think for advertisers, when they're slow, there's a price to pay. But when you're on the receiving end of the money slow coming in, it, you're sweating bullets. Um, we were no advertised supported cable network had ever been successful. They didn't think it was a business model. And the board of directors kept calling us a sieve and wanted to shut us down. Steve Ross, who ran Warner Communications, that was one of our owners, uh, sort of dug his heels and said, you're not going to shut it down. And, uh, and we finally got profitable. We were the most profitable basic cable network when I was there. We were the first profitable basic cable network with the highest revenue. And, uh, and I think it's probably because of the uniqueness of MTV that we were able to push it forward. And we were able to embed the advertisers into things like contests and promotions and content in ways that normal TV couldn't do or wouldn't do. When I come back to Mississippi, I'm looking for very crispy fried okra, cornmeal please. Uh, I'm looking for fried catfish, and I'm looking for barbecue pork. And if I have those three things, I think I'm happy and I'm enjoying that Mississippi cuisine that my, my gut remembers from my childhood. I was in New York when they started doing the Mississippi picnic. Uh, one of my childhood friends, family friends, was one of the organizers of it. I went every year, and one year I went, and I met this guy named Alan Hunter. And uh, he was married to uh, someone who was a childhood uh, uh, family friend. And we started talking about this thing we were doing called MTV and that we were going to do. And he was talking about, he was an actor and he'd been in a David Bowie video. And I said, well, you should audition for this thing called MTV. And he, uh, and, and because of that Mississippi picnic, Alan and I met each other. We got him an audition, and he became one of the, the one of the five original VJs on MTV. I think the biggest moment of MTV was uh, there was a guy named Drew Lewis, who had been the Secretary of Transportation under Ronald Reagan. And if you remember history, he fired all the air traffic controllers. He was a tough guy. When he left the Reagan administration, they hired him to run this Warner Amex joint venture, which was controlling MTV, and. I had a meeting with him, and, uh, and by the way, this was a guy who had never heard of the Rolling Stones, didn't know who Mick Jagger was, uh, but he just knew business. And he had lunch, and he said, I said, Bob, I was the chief operating officer of the company, then responsible for the operations. And he said, Bob, if you can't get this thing profitable by the end of the year, we're going to shut it down. And everybody had protected me before Steve Ross. They said, well, you can't protect from this guy. This guy's just like tough as nails. He's going to get his way. So I, for probably about 10 months, sweated bullets going, my God, what are we going to do? Cut costs, bring in this advertiser, do, do whatever it took, get this thing profitable. And by about November, it became apparent we were going to make money. And uh, by December, we were profitable. And, uh, and when it became profitable, I knew we had arrived because once you're profitable, you're self-sustaining. I don't need anybody to contribute money for us to keep going. And, uh, and we're on our way. And so that was sort of the, the moment for us. That was the end of 1983. You know, it's fun to see it. I haven't been back to Mississippi in a while. Uh, Martha Quinn flew down with me from New York, one of the original VJs. Uh, a friend of mine, Andy Lack, who used to run NBC News and Sony Music and Bloomberg and a bunch of other things, uh, flew down as well. And, uh, and he is uh, both very involved in Mississippi, and I've known Andy back through my days of starting MTV. And so it's sort of interesting. It's this nice reflective moment to think it's 40 years. Could I possibly be that old? Uh, it seems like in some ways yesterday, and in other ways it does seem like 40 years. But so much has gone on. So much of who I am started there. Uh, so much of the sort of the confidence I got as a business person and the credibility I got as a business person and a creative was really came out of MTV. So this moment, August 1, 81, 8181, is a very magic number for me.